Welcome to Reagan and Friends, a podcast series hosted by the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Each month, we will share some behind the scenes moments and stories of President Reagan with some of his more famous friends. But what do you say about someone who gives your life meaning? What do you say about someone who's always there with support and understanding? Someone who makes sacrifices so that your life will be easier and more successful. But what you say is that you love that person and treasure her. I, I simply can't imagine the last eight years without Nancy. Nancy Davis Reagan was born Anne Frances Robbins on July 6, 1921, in Queens, New York, to Edith Luckett Robbins and Kenneth Seymour Robbins. She was named after her grandmothers, but was nicknamed Nancy by her mother at an early age. Edith and Kenneth were married on June 27, 1916, and five years later, Edith was due to have her first child. According to family legend, Nancy was actually due on the 4th of July. But as her mother was a devoted baseball fan and determined to see a doubleheader that day, she somehow managed to delay the birth. When her mother finally did arrive at the hospital, she was told there were no rooms available and she would have to go somewhere else. Edith Robbins refused to take no for an answer. She simply sat down in the middle of the reception room floor and announced that she would have her baby right there. The hospital found her a room. It was a particularly hot afternoon and Edith overheard the doctor say that he wanted to hurry up and deliver the baby so he could go get out on the golf course. Forceps were needed to help with the difficult delivery, and as a result, Nancy's right eye wouldn't open. When the doctor told Edith that Nancy might be blind in that eye, she angrily informed him that she heard he was in a rush to get out and play golf, and threatened him with bodily harm if her daughter's eye didn't open. Fortunately for the doctor, Nancy's eye opened two weeks later. Edith and Kenneth's marriage didn't last, and they separated in 1922. Edith took sole responsibility for raising Nancy. At that time, Edith was a stage actress, traveling from show to show. In 1923, she reluctantly decided to leave Nancy with her sister and brother-in-law, Virginia and C. Audley Galbraith, who embraced Nancy into their loving and happy family. Nancy lived with the Galbraiths until Edith remarried in 1929 to Dr. Loyal Davis, and the three of them settled down in Chicago. In 1931, as a fifth grade student, Nancy enrolled in the prestigious Girls Latin School. She also became quite close with Dr. Davis, eventually considering him her true father. On April 19, 1938, at the age of 16, Nancy filed a petition to be adopted by Dr. Davis, also requesting that her name be changed. Anne Frances Robbins legally became Nancy Davis. Following high school, Nancy attended Smith College, where she also decided to follow in her mother's footsteps and be an actress. Well, my mother was an actress, and um, I had gone to college and graduated and hadn't found the man I wanted to marry, and I didn't want to sit in Chicago and do nothing. So, uh, I became an actress. Nancy signed a seven-year contract with Warner Brothers, appearing in 11 films between 1949 and 1957. Her first role was in Death in the Dollhouse with Anne Southern. She also worked with some of the biggest names in Hollywood, Ava Gardner, Gary Cooper, Gene Kelly, Janet Leigh, and George Murphy. Of the films she made in her early career, Nancy was especially proud of her work in Night Into Morning and The Next Voice You Hear. In the fall of 1949, while serving as president of the Screen Actors Guild, Ronald Reagan received a phone call from Nancy Reagan, who had asked him for help. She was worried about being confused with another actress of the same name, who had a connection to communist friend groups. They met for dinner to discuss the problem and ended up staying out half the night. Within a few months, they dated only each other. To avoid the intrusion of the Hollywood press, Ronald and Nancy Reagan were married in a secret, quiet ceremony in the Little Brown Church in the Valley on March 4, 1952, attended only by the minister and their best man and matron of honor, Bill and Argus Holden. The ceremony was followed by pictures and dinner in the Holden's home and an overnight honeymoon in Riverside, California. The newlyweds then drove to Phoenix, Arizona, where they joined Nancy's parents who were vacationing there. If ever God gave me evidence that he had a plan for me, it was the night he brought Nancy into my life. Sometimes I think my life really began when I met Nancy. From the start, our marriage has been like an adolescent's dream of what a marriage should be. It was rich and full from the beginning and has gotten more so with each day. Nancy moved into my heart and replaced an emptiness that I'd been trying to ignore for a long time. Coming home to her is like coming out of the cold into a warm, firelit room. I miss her if she just steps out of the room. 
Nancy Reagan left her career in Hollywood to focus on being a wife and mother. In February of 1965, after much discussion with Nancy, Ronald Reagan decided to explore a possible gubernatorial run in California. On January 4th, 1966, Ronald Reagan declared his candidacy for the Republican nomination for governor and went on to win the primary easily. As her husband settled into the business of running the state, Nancy began to look for worthwhile projects to champion as First Lady. As a doctor's daughter, she was naturally interested in helping the sick. She began visiting hospitals, talking, and listening to the patients. It was in one of these visits she learned about Foster Grandparents, a program founded by Sergeant Shriver, which paired elderly people and needy children. The adults were often lonely, and the program provided them with an opportunity to be a role model to children who needed their patience and experience. The children, often mentally handicapped or institutionalized, benefited from the attention and love they received from the seniors. The grandparents tutored and mentored the children and provided support and guidance. Nancy was excited about the program and was soon helping to raise public and private funding. Nancy's sponsorship helped bring national awareness to the program, and chapters expanded in other states. Foster Grandparents is still operating nationwide and has expanded to include deaf children and juvenile offenders. She continued this program as First Lady of the United States. I'm greatly honored, um, and this means a, a very great deal to me personally. Arnold, your remarks were really so kind, and I appreciate them so much. You were kind enough to mention the thousands of people, young and old, who have a special place in my heart. You know, for the last eight years, I've had a unique opportunity to witness the extraordinary compassion of the American people of people like each of you, like each of you have, for those who are less fortunate. So let me just say that really, this award belongs to the millions of American volunteers, to the parents and children involved in the 15,000 Just Say No programs around the country, and the 24,000 men and women participating in the Foster Grandparent Program, the cause most important to Mrs. Reagan as First Lady of California was that of Vietnam War veterans, prisoners of war, and soldiers missing in action. She was deeply grateful to those who had fought on behalf of our nation and dismayed that they were not welcomed home by the public as the heroes they were. She began by visiting veterans' hospitals where she would sit with wounded soldiers for hours on end. She would read to them, listen to them, and call their families for them. When the first plane loads of returning POWs landed in California, Governor and Mrs. Reagan were waiting to greet them. Nancy organized a series of dinners held in the Reagan residences in Sacramento and Los Angeles to welcome them home. Mrs. Reagan believed that their involvement with the POWs and MIAs were the high point of their years in Sacramento. Upon becoming the First Lady of the United States on January 20, 1981, Mrs. Reagan focused her efforts on becoming the best First Lady she could. She once said with the exaggerated ups and downs of life at the White House, I found out what is really important to me. I learned how to serve. In the early months as First Lady, she visited several drug treatment centers, met with the board of directors for the National Federation of Parents for Drug-Free Youth, and attended a meeting of the American Council on Marijuana. A name for Mrs. Reagan's cause was chosen after she met with school children in Oakland. A little girl raised her hand, Mrs. Reagan recalled, and said, Mrs. Reagan, what do you do if someone offers you drugs? And I said, well, you just say no. And there it was born. The phrase caught on and was eventually adopted as the name for clubs and schools' anti-drug programs. By 1988, more than 12,000 Just Say No clubs have been formed across the country and around the world. What we've got to do now is make certain that we continue to give our young people like the ones with us here today, the support and backing they need to just say no to drugs. There's someone else here who shares these sentiments. She was a favorite of mine even before she got involved in this issue. <laughs> However, I will have to confess that she's made me such a proud husband in these last few years. Nancy was and still is the motivational force behind the Just Say No movement. As First Lady of California and again as First Lady of the United States, Mrs. Reagan was known for her style. Although she mostly wore designs by designer Jimmy Galanos, she also wore Caroline Herrera, Diane von Fostenberg, Oscar de la Renta, and others. In 1985, she received this letter and sketch from designer Carl Lagerfeld, who was the head of Chanel at the time. There were even fashion paper dolls made of Mrs. Reagan. In each annual Gallup poll from 1981 to 1989, the American public voted Mrs. Reagan as one of the 10 most admired women in the world, and in 1981, 1985, and 1987, she was voted number one. She received numerous awards for her leadership role in the fight against drug abuse, including recognition from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the USO, the Salvation Army, and others. 
As First Lady of the United States, she received many gifts, including this 23 karat gold purse from the First Lady of Indonesia and this egg-shaped blown glass perfume bottle from Brian Mulroney, the Prime Minister of Canada. In almost every State of the Union address President Reagan gave, he recognized an ordinary person who had achieved a great act and applauded them as a hero. In his last State of the Union address on January 25, 1988, he saluted a very special hero, his wife. We can be proud that our students are just saying no to the drugs. But But let us remember what this menace requires. Commitment from every part of America and every single American. A commitment to drug-free America. The war against drugs is a war of individual battles. A crusade with many heroes, including America's young people, and also someone very special to me. She has helped so many of our young people to say no to drugs. Nancy, much credit belongs to you, and I want to express to you your husband's pride and your country's thanks. Surprised you, didn't I? <laughs> After leaving office, President and Mrs. Reagan returned home to their beloved state of California. They traveled the world domestically and internationally, giving speeches, writing books, and focusing their attention on the opening of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library and Museum, which opened on November 4, 1991. Sadly, their golden years were cut short with the diagnosis that the president suffered from Alzheimer's disease. President and Mrs. Reagan made the courageous decision to share the president's diagnosis with the American people in the hopes that it would raise awareness of the condition and promote understanding and compassion for those who are affected by the cruel disease. President and Mrs. Reagan realized the need for increased research into prevention, treatments, and ultimately a cure for Alzheimer's. And in October of 1995, they joined forces with the National Alzheimer Association by forming an Alzheimer's Association affiliate, the Ronald and Nancy Reagan Research Institute. In later years, Mrs. Reagan focused her efforts on raising awareness and funds for stem cell research. Just four years ago, Ronnie stood before you and spoke for what he said might be his last speech at a Republican convention. Sadly, his words were too prophetic. Sorry. May God bless him, and from both of us, God bless America. Following the passing of her beloved husband, Mrs. Reagan dedicated herself to carrying on his legacy at the foundation which bears his name. She helped renovate the museum in 2001. She hosted Republican presidential candidate debates, and she helped bring her husband back to Washington, D.C. with the creation of the Reagan Institute. Through it all, she never stopped missing or thinking about her Ronnie. She visited the Reagan Library each year on June 5th, the anniversary of his passing, to lay flowers at his gravesite and spend some private time with him. Although it was a tremendous loss to our foundation and the country when she passed away in 2016, we all knew that it meant she could be together with him again. The third age in Shakespeare's Seven Ages of Man is the lover sighing like a furnace with a woeful ballard. Shakespeare, of course, is gently mocking young lovers. Their passion always burns hot, he said, and then it fades. Well, the bard never met Nancy or her Ronnie. As Prime Minister Mulroney has pointed out, they could hardly bear to be apart. When he was on a movie set or on the road for General Electric or as a candidate or as governor, or as president, he wrote her every single night. When they were together, he hid love notes around the house for her to find. One Christmas at Pacific Palisades, he wrote, whatever I treasure and enjoy, all would be without meaning if I didn't have you. I live in a permanent Christmas because God gave me you. 
thank you for watching. Don't forget that when you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll be notified every time new videos and podcasts are added to our site, including our Reagan and Friends, Words to Live By, and Reagan Forum podcasts. And don't forget to follow at Ronald Reagan on Facebook and Twitter, as well as at Reagan Foundation on Instagram and YouTube.